Last July, all of us were taken aback by some heartbreaking news that disrupted our lives. A couple of teenagers in Caracal were allegedly kidnapped by a local man and then abused and later probably murdered. And this was a terrible collective story. And we in our newsroom at Door felt that we needed to find a way to tell the story. Now we've been telling complicated stories for 10 years. And we've been telling stories that many of us don't really want to hear. And we wanted to find a way to tell this one, but tell it differently. This is already all over social media. This was all over television. We didn't, wa we didn't want to add to the panic, to the disinformation, or to the sense of hopelessness that we get in situations like this, where you feel you can't walk out of your house because you can't trust anyone. So we did what we've been doing in recent history. We turned to our community for guidance and asked them what kind of story would they want us to tell. And this is what we heard. Please don't tell another murder story. Please don't tell another story about a failing state bureaucracy. Please don't tell another hopeless story that makes us want to pack up and leave Romania. So my colleague Anna took a different approach. She decided to go and ask teenage girls what this event meant to them. What were they saying about it? Most importantly, what were they saying to each other about it? So what Anna and a bunch of other colleagues did is they set up discussion groups across the country, from Bacău to București to Braza, to talk to young women about what was going on in their lives. And what we heard is that violence and abuse and fear were things that they were already living with. The fear was already here, is what one of them told us, and that became sort of our mantra for this story. And this fear is something that was following these young women around as they walked the streets during the day, during the night, at parties, at festivals, and in other places where they might leave their lives. And this fear was there, maybe not a fear of violence, but certainly a fear of verbal abuse or of who knows what kind of unsavory encounter. And they told us this is how young women grow up in Romania. They want to make their own choices and leave their own lives, but fear is always somewhere in the background. And what happened during the story is that Anna, while talking to these young women, remembered there was an episode in her own past that had to deal with abuse, something she had undergone as a teenager herself. And this is a story she buried out of fear, yes, but also out of shame. But being around these young women, Anna felt that this is a safe place to tell her story. So she did, and she told it in the article as well. And something interesting happened when Anna told her story. Very recently after, she got a message from another journalist on Instagram who told her, and this is what Anna related back to me, the article relieved her. She didn't know anyone who would confess to having endured something. She felt less alone and less broken after reading. And almost nine months later, we still get messages. Anna still gets messages about this story. And this actually is from this week. Someone wrote to Anna, your story encouraged me to confess my own experience of abuse to my boyfriend and then to those closest to me. So what is this about? Well, this is largely about a very simple but profound truth that has to do with telling stories. And it's best exemplified in a movie about the writer C.S. Lewis where he says, we read to know we are not alone. And he was talking about fiction, but this is true of any story, in any format, in any medium, whether imagined or true. It's true for literature, it's true for film, it's true for YouTube story time, and it's true for journalism. And stories play many, many functions in our lives, but arguably, at least for me, the most important is this. 
that stories allow us to be less alone, they allow us to belong, they bring us together, and they show us how many things we have in common with each other. Now, any storyteller who does his craft responsibly knows that stories carry tremendous power. And here's some of the things that stories do really powerfully. They guide us through our struggles, they heal our wounds, they open us up to others, they make us feel that we are enough, and once again, they show us that we are not alone, that they can bring us together. And I know some of you might think, yeah, 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 this is just feel good stuff, but recent research has shown that there are two things in the way we tell stories that correlate with our well-being. And it's these two, agency, which is the feeling that you are in control of your own life, and communion, which is your ability to have good relationships with others. When Anna told her story, she tapped into both of this. She gave these young women a space in which to talk about the experience they had undergone and take control of their stories. She herself had the opportunity to tell her story, regain control over it, and change that narrative from one of shame into one where she does no longer feel like anything that happened was her fault. That's agency, giving people the opportunity to be in control of their own narrative. Communion goes like this. We tapped into communion when we did the story by bringing groups together. Communion was very important when we received all the feedback that I showed you before. But communion was also very important after we published the story because we reprinted it in hundreds of zines and took it to high schools, mostly around Bucharest, where Anna spent hours talking to students and teachers about abuse, about violence, about bullying, about what they can do to live better lives. And this is what a 10th grader told Anna after one of her visits. After you left, this was the first time we spent on break together talking. We listened to one another and there were no more rivalries. We needed to listen to one another and know each other differently than before. This is a 10th grader, that's just amazing. So what does this mean for journalism? Now, for those of you in the audience that are activists or social entrepreneurs or aid workers or caregivers of any kind, nothing that I've said so far is new to you. You know how this system works. But for journalists, this is new. This is a new way uh, for us to do our work. So my idea for you today is that the role of the modern journalist and the way they interact with the community is changing or should change. Traditionally, what we've done as journalists is go after bad people, tell you who's a threat to democracy, tell you where the latest virus outbreak is, tell you who you need to hate, mostly, because it's safer. And I hope that we will keep doing that, and I hope we will keep doing that responsibly. But I also think that sometime this role of watchdog of democracy that we have taken on as journalists as, as journalists, makes us forget that our power comes from you. Our responsibility is to you. And our purpose is to help you lead better lives. You, our public, the, the citizens, and so on. And shouting about everything that doesn't go well in life is sometimes not incredibly helpful. There's been a lot of studies recently that have shown that people, all of us, are turning away from news. And the main reason they're turning away is because it makes them feel bad. Now here's what's happening. Journalism is failing sometimes at giving you agency, which means it is telling you stories that make you hopeless about your own ability to change the environment around you. Not just your life, but your community's life. And it doesn't do communion very well either, because instead of connecting you with others, it's isolating you by spreading fear. 
And this is why around the world, there's a new crop of journalists that says, we're doing the watchdog role, we're doing investigations, those are important, but we need to find ways to reconnect with the people that give us our power and that give us our, the license to do our job, and that is you. So, and this scares many of my colleagues, our role now should include many of these things. We need to be facilitators, moderators, mediators, true listeners, students of better ways of doing things in the world, and partners with the people that are trying to create change. And this means that we need to start building communities around small stories and big stories. For us, in, in our work at, at DOR, this has been something that we've been thinking about for 10 years, although we didn't really know what we, we were going after. We wanted to understand our community, be relevant to them, while at the same time telling them um, sometimes uncomfortable stories that might help them see Romania in a more complete light. Um, but absolutely, we wanted, we wanted to make them feel like they were part of a community they belong in. Uh, we brought them into our newsroom and gave them cookies and wine. Uh, we taught classes. We taught them everything we know about storytelling. We did workshops. We hosted conversations with other professions in rooms large and small. Um, we went to Yash, to Cluj, to Târgu Mureș, and met with communities there and figured out how they do things uh, and what they're about over there. We brought hundreds and hundreds and then up to a thousand people together for live storytelling shows in order to connect better with the audience and put them, bring them closer to stories. But what we're doing differently in terms of the idea that, that I mentioned now is Right now, with stories like the one Anna did, we are doing something uh, even more consciously, and that is trying to find ways to do journalism that's empowered by you. And that means asking our public how we should cover a story. That means sometimes going out into the field together with the people that we're writing about. And especially, it means having as many conversations as possible uh, around that topic. And I'll share a couple of more examples with you. Juana on our team has been writing about um, domestic violence for years now. Last year, she did a story about a support group in Satumare, where a local policewoman brings together survivors of domestic abuse, and they share uh, they share their stories and they share the stories of what this trauma has uh, done to their lives. And now you understand that the power of a storytelling space is to validate someone's own experience and then make them feel like they're not alone. So Juana said, okay, let me try to do that off the page with my stories too. So she started bringing people into the newsroom, readers, survivors of abuse. And at one point she actually had the whole ecosystem working around this uh, problem around the same table. That means police, prosecutors, social workers, therapists. These people had never been around the same table together. They had no idea what the others were doing for the same problem. And it was a journalist that brought them together and in a very non-traditional way. It was just one and six people around the table, not on a page, not on a screen. Um, and Wana said, it's a miracle that we as journalists can do our job like that bring people together, connect them, and hopefully they will find ways to do their jobs better. Uh, and we don't do this just with serious stories, and I'll uh, only share one um, example. These people that we brought into our newsroom a month ago had only one thing in common. Last year in 2019, they all turned 30. That means they were all born in 1989, uh, the, the year of the Romanian Revolution, and sort of, they're as old as Romanian democracy. That's the only thing they had in common. We brought them together. They talked about what freedom means to them, what they learned during these 30 years, and they just wouldn't leave. <laughs> so they stayed late into, uh, into the night, and one of them wrote to us after this was done, and I'll, uh, I just want to pull this out because it's a longer quote. Uh, sorry. I'm a journalist, I have notes. So one of them said this, 
I walked home after the meeting and I kept thinking what I would have missed if I didn't show up. How many things like this I missed without knowing. I recall the moment from when I was five years old hanging from a tall fence. The other kids had all jumped at the fence to get cherries. I was too scared. But starting today, I'm all in. It must have been all those amazing people together. We have started to measure our impact like this. Yes, journalists want to see people in jail. They want to see bad companies disappear from the face of the planet. They wanna, you know, bring justice to the world. Uh, but I would like us to also do smaller things like this. Remind people that they are not alone. Remind people that we have more things in common that separate us and bring uh, everyone together. So what can you do? Do you have to become a journalist? No. Although if you do, we can, we can talk over lunch. Um, here's the thing. The complex problems of the world we live in today require some really complex solutions. And complex solutions only come from people talking to each other, creating ideas together, and then crafting a better future together. The problem with being together in a world where each of us lives in their own bubble is that it's very hard to connect and be vulnerable in order to create. The good news is that stories create the space for vulnerability. So here, I, I will leave you with these three things. Share your story at any point you can. Your fears, your failures, your victories, your obstacles, share them with your coworkers, your friends, your family. And then create spaces at meetings, dinners, gatherings, where others can do the same, and you will experience the same kind of energy of a small community that was formed around a common issue that you can later nurture and create amazing things together with those people. Because as you probably all know, when we act together, we are more powerful than when we act individually. Thank you.